real quick video clip. I forgot to mention that you in the introduction of this that you also need to pay attention for the random uh, things just like normal for the uh, quiz on this module. So just go to that at the beginning because I forgot to say it at the beginning in the main one. So anyway, cheers. <laughs> back to the lecture. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to be looking at module three, or at least in this video, we're going to look at module three. Um, it should be a little, relatively quick, right? Uh, this is part of the series that is basically looking at the biology of the, the brain and the nervous system and all these kinds of things. So uh, it's the very, the very foundation. So module three, the neural and hormonal systems um, within our bodies. <clears throat> um, apologize too. I, I noticed I've watched some of these videos back. I do this <clears throat> a lot. I had COVID a few months ago, and ever since then, it just won't go away. So that, that, that little like cl throat clearing thing, that's where that's from. But anyway, um, so yeah, looking at the, the neural hormonal systems. Um, <clears throat> there it is again. I'm going to notice it. Anyway, uh, before I get going in this, though, I'm going to apologize in advance for all of you medical students or biology students. I'm going to butcher a lot of these words. I apologize for that in advance. Um, it's just not my thing. That's why I'm not a biologist. I am a psychologist, right? So uh, but let's go ahead and get rolling. As always, you can follow along with the PowerPoints, just like I've explained in the other videos. You know, pull them up um, in, in D2L, print them off, download them, just have it open on a different window, whatever you want to do. You can do that as we go, and I'll let you know where we go. I'm going to try to move through this fairly quickly because you have several of them to do um, during this, this section. So here we go. Uh, so slide two, biology, behavior, and mind. Humans are biopsychosocial systems, which we've already kind of talked about, right? Three common, three elements to us that make us who we are, basically. Our biology, what's going on inside our, our, our physical system. Psychology, how are we interpreting that information? And then the social side of things, that looking at the, 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 the environment in which the individual is in, okay? So understanding behavior requires study of interactions among biological, psychological, and social systems, like we just said. Biological psychologists use advanced technologies to study these links. So if, if this is basically what they're looking at is how does our biology, your heart rate, what's going on in your, your you know, uh, adrenal systems and all kinds of things, how do they affect the physical stuff? How does it affect our psychology? Okay. Now remember, everything is simultaneously going to be biological and psychological that happens within you. Every thought, every feeling, everything that you experience is both a biological and a psychological uh, event, essentially, happening simultaneously. Okay. Um, this is going to be that, that nurture versus nature versus nurture kind of a thing, right? Um, how much is it that you're born with, your, your genetics and all that kind of stuff, versus how much is it that you are... Um, picking up from your environment, right? How much is it, are you being shaped by the, the events that have occurred to you? Um, so neuroplasticity makes the human brain unique. We have the most, as far as we can tell, that we have the most plastic mind or brain of any creature on the planet. Um, meaning that our, basically our ability to adapt to any given environment is phenomenal. It's above and beyond basically anything else that we know of. Um, only thing they probably can adapt as well as we can is going to be like in the micro level. When you get to a, the level of, of creatures that we are, um, it, it's going to be rare to find something that can, can shift as well as we can. Um, biology and experience interact to facilitate new pathways as the brain changes and adapts to a changing world. So we're born, for example, our, our neurons are basically just, we, we have a, a, like a thicket of, of brain growth initially within our first couple of years of life. Um, what, what's going to happen then from that thicket, as you use different parts of the brain through language and all these kinds of things, um, it begins to get pruned, literally. That's the word that we use. We, it, the brain prunes itself back, where essentially it, 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 the, the pathways you use regularly for like language or things like that are going to get stronger um, versus the, the uh, like anything that you don't use regularly, those are going to get pruned away to basically not waste energy in those areas. Okay, um, so all the experiences and everything that you have from conception to some extent, right? The first, when you're first one cell little critter um, to the person that you are today and then continue to be, uh, all of the experiences that you've had 
will have an effect upon that, uh, what your brain basically works and how it, how it interprets things. Um, so yeah, that's what we're looking at. Plasticity, again, when we look at plasticity, it's not like plastic, like this mouse is plastic. It is plastic, like the ability to change and mold, right? Change its, change its, it's uh, like, like Plato has a plasticity to it, right? Um, silly putty has a plasticity. Concrete does not. Our brain is plastic in this way. Okay, next slide, slide three. Some of the, these are gonna be some of the words you're gonna wanna be aware of. It'll make it much easier if you just kinda have these like in your brain and, and, and understanding what they mean, okay. So some terms to learn, neuron. A neuron is the nerve cell, right? It's the most basic form of the, the most basic building block of the nervous system, basically. Um, the brain itself is made up of billions of neurons, okay? Your whole nervous system is made up of neurons. So neurons are throughout your entire body. It's basically the, the electrical communication system of the brain, okay? Uh, cell body is a part of a neuron that contains the nucleus, the cell's life support system. Pretty straightforward, right? If every neuron is a cell, every cell has to have a body basically to, to, to hold that one cell together. Um, a dendrite is the neurons often bushy branching extensions that receive and integrate messages conducting impulses toward the cell body. These are the ears, if you will, not literally, okay? But these are the ears of the neuron. This is how the neuron receives communications from the other neurons that are connected to it, okay? The axon is the neuron's extension that passes messages through its branches. This is the mouth. This is the voice of the individual neuron. Um, it's gonna be, we're gonna be looking at this more in depth of what that actually is, but it's it essentially, it, it sends a chemical messenger that will, um, from the, from the axon to the dendrite, okay, um, of the other neurons around it. When those chemical messengers come into contact with the, the uh, dendrites of the given neuron, it basically causes a, a potential excitement within it. In other words, it, it increases the energy potential. Once it hits a certain level, it sends a signal and boom, there's a, there's a firing and there's something happens within the individual cell. We'll look at that in a second here. Um, myelin sheathing or myelin sheath is a, uh, it's basically a fatty coating. So if you think of this as electrical, right? The, 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 the whole nervous system essentially is our electrical system within our body. Um, if you get zapped by something, this is the part that really gets affected like rough, like very badly. But um, the myelin sheath as an electrical system is like the rubber coating on an extension cord. Okay. Um, but in this case, instead of rubber, it's fat. Okay. So as the brain develops, basically the, the myelination of the brain is actually what allows our, us to think the way we do as adults compared to like a brand new infant. Infants have very little myelination occurring, um, which is why part of the reason why they can't think very critically yet. Okay. Um, so in that pruning, my, uh, there's, a, there's an increase in myelin sheathing that in, basically increases the efficiency of the brain. So just as if you took the rubber coating off of, off of a extension cord and plugged it in, power is gonna be going everywhere, right? There's gonna be a chance of getting electrocuted all over the place. Um, Essentially, you remove the myelin sheathing from the, the nervous system and you, you increase that chance of that like electricity basically just kind of going everywhere. Okay. Um, glial cells, or glia, uh, <clears throat> these are cells in the nervous system that support, nourish, and protect neurons. They may also play a role in learning, thinking, and memory. As far as we can tell, they in fact do play a role in those things, uh, but we're, we're learning more about exactly how those work. Uh, action potential is the neural impulse, a brief electrical charge that travels down an axon. Uh, let's see, we're, we'll, we'll wait on that. We're going we're gonna to talk about that more in depth here in just a second, but that's essentially what that is. An action potential is once it reaches a certain level of, of energy buildup, boom, it sends off its, its signals to the next thing. We'll talk about that in a second. But next slide, slide four. This is a picture of the neuron. Um, you can also find this on page 40 of our book. If you're following along with the book instead of the PowerPoints, um, but you have the cell body, right? The main core life support system, basically, of the individual cell. Um, you have the dendrites, or those little hairy things that are, are surrounding it. Uh, they're the parts that receive the messages, the electrical impulses coming from other neurons, so that it can bring it into itself. Um, the axons, or the passes passes messages away from the cell body to other neurons, muscles, or glands. Okay depending on the, where, where this is specifically set. 
um, terminal branches of axon are formed junctions with other cells. So the terminal branches are going to be basically coming right up close to the dendrites. Um, and that's going to be where the communication occurs. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a gap basically between the two where it's like the, 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 the ultimate game of don't touch me. They're, they're almost touching. They're so close. And yet there's a little tiny gap. And that is where the communication occurs is within that cap or gap. It's a, um, it's a chemical communication basically where one, when, when it's trying to produce it, it produces the chemical and then the other one receives it, which then causes the electrical charge to build up. Um, we have myelin sheathing that covers the axon of some neurons and helps speed neural impulses. And then the neural impulse itself, the action potential, which is the electrical signal traveling down the axon, basically triggering those chemical uh, reactions um, to be sent out. Okay. Next slide, slide five. Neural communication part two. Um, the neural impulse or action potential, it fires changes down the axon when stimulated. Okay. Um, electricity is generated from chemical events. Ions, uh, electrically charged atoms are exchanged in this. And there's actually an image of this. So we're going to look at it here in just a second on the PowerPoint, but you can also see it on, on page uh, 41 within our book, talking about that, that what's happening um, chemically to make this happen. Um, so you have inhibitory versus ex, uh, excitatory signals, which essentially some of these signals are going to tell, tell the neuron to basically get excited, build up energy. Some of them are going to tell them to back off, reduce the energy levels. Okay. Um, you have a threshold, which is uh, uh, basically the, the, the level of simulation that's required in order for it to fire. Okay. Um, one way to think of this, okay, is a neuron, the neuron, how it communicates is equivalent to a gun or, or a, a firearm of some kind. Okay. Um, even if it's like a Nerf gun, whatever you want to look at it. But with any given gun, there's a certain amount of force that must be pulled on the trigger in order for the firing pin or whatever, like the air or whatever to be released if you're looking at paintball guns or Nerf or whatever. But there's a certain amount of pressure that must be exerted on the trigger in order for it to fire. Okay. The threshold of a neuron is how much force has to be built up in order for it to fire. Okay. Um, the refractory period is basically the amount of time that it takes for it to re- set itself. It's reloading. If you've got a machine gun, it's able to reload really fast. These can reload unbelievably fast, but basically it's that there is a moment where it is fired and it is resetting itself, getting ready for the next communication. And it's an all or none response, right? Just like a gun, you can't kind of sort of shoot a gun. It's either, either that shell is down the, going down range or it's not, right? And that's, that's going to be the, the thing there. Okay. Um, uh, so let's take a look at that. So again, on, if you're on page 41 or in this next slide, slide six, um, this is basically kind of walking you through it. Um, and so you have that threshold where suddenly you, you've reached the point where the energy has built up to a certain level and it automatically fires at that point um, and then has a moment of resetting after that firing, that action potential. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm actually going to let you all look at that one and then read it yourself in the book and or on this slide. It's pretty straightforward. Um, essentially, it, it, it's going to be a, a chemical uh, balance where you, you, you go from uh, your body wants to have a, a certain state of balance, right, between positive and negative ions and all those kinds of things. Um, how, it, how it essentially causes this to build up is that it, it replaces some with others, which then causes this triggering. Okay. I've been, there's also some videos I've included in D2L. Um, so if you look there, you'll find some more things that talk about this more in depth. If you really want to look at the chemistry, like that's what you're going to look at. Um, this isn't super, super important. Like if you, if you don't understand this exactly, that's okay. Just understand the idea of the power building up. <clears throat> and once it reaches a certain level, it's, it's, it sends a signal. If it never, if it doesn't reach that level, it can't send a signal. Okay. There's no misfire basically. It, it has to get to a certain level in order to, in, to achieve any form of action. Okay, slide seven. Neural communication part three. Uh, how neurotransmitters influence motions and emotions. So neurotransmitters are going to be the, the, the chemical compounds that are essentially uh, causing the communication to happen between neurons. Okay, um, so different, different chemical uh, things in there are going to cause different neurons to do different things, basically. So, um, Excetacholine or ACH 
plays a role in learning and memory from what we've discovered. That's one of the, one of the key things that it does. Um, it's a messenger between motor neurons and skeletal muscles. Um, so the, the parts that basically cause you to move and, and like motor memory, or you might, you might hear like people say I have like you know, muscle memory, that's going to be connected to the acetylcholine. Okay. Um, but it allows the body to basically effectively move through space. Okay. Endorphins, a naturally occurring opiate produced in the brain. So endorphins are going to be like what you experience that make you feel happy. Okay. Um, it's also going to be the thing that when your body kicks into gear when you experience um, discomfort. So if you if you're if, if any of you all run, uh, if you're long like a long distance runner, or if you lift heavy, um, like powerlifting and stuff like that, or you you like just anything where you're putting your body under a lot of strain, okay. Backpackers a lot of times will experience this. If you're in the military and you like ever like rucked with a very heavy pack, um, you might experience this also. But basically, your body starts to hurt because of the exertion that you're putting upon it. Your body to to compensate for that will release endorphins. If you've ever gotten a tattoo, right, endorphins are released in that moment because it's uncomfortable and your body's like, I'm sorry, we're gonna try to make it feel better and it starts to release endorphins. If you've given birth, if you're a woman who's given birth, um, you have experienced an endorphin rush because your body basically is like, we're gonna kind of make up for the fact that this hurts a lot and make you feel a little better, okay? So a runner's high or you get that high from lifting heavy, um, or carrying a heavy pack, or giving birth, or all these kinds of things. Those are due to the endorphins being released. Um, <clears throat> and the, the, the key thing there is also, it's an opiate. It's a natural occurring opiate that occurs within us. Our body produces it. When you take drugs that are also opiates, which we'll look at when we look at the module on drugs, um, essentially what those are are outside sources that imitate our opiates that we naturally produce and overload us with them. So we'll look at that more in depth when we look at that, at that module. That's kind of an interesting one to look at. But So how drugs and other chemicals alter neurotransmission? Um, agonist molecules increase neurotransmitter action. Antagonist molecules decrease neurotransmitter action. So basically some are going to either up it or lower it. Okay, It increases the amount of neurotransmitters that are available. Or it, it might imitate them as, as opiates might. Um, or it might reduce the amount of neurotransmitters available, which causes uh, certain kinds of effects within our brain also. Uh, you can find this table 3.1 is found on page 44, and it gives you a whole list of how these different neurotransmitters affect us um, and what happens when they malfunction. For example, example um, acetylcholine, they found if you it uh, enables muscle action, learning, and memory. If you have... Uh, when you have it, like it's out of whack with you, you can increase chances of Alzheimer's disease. Um, ACH producing neurons deteriorate over time, which then causes Alzheimer's potentially. Okay, um, for example, and then there's a whole bunch in there. Again, I'm going to let you look at that on page 44 um, to get that information. Slide eight: How neurons communicate. So you have the synapses. Okay. Um, so if, if looking at this picture, let me see if I can find a picture of this again. This is on page 43 in the book. So we're going back actually. But um, on here, this is going to be the, the, the basic breakdown of that if you're looking at the slides on slide eight here. Um, so the, the synapsis is the, the little gap, okay, between the two neurons. So you have the sending neuron and its action potential with the little, and then the little synapse is going to be that little tiny gap where you have the chemi uh, chemical communication occurring. Okay, the sending one is releasing chemicals into that gap, right? Um, so that's the neurotransmitters. That's going to be the various chemical components that our body is basically producing um, and then and then putting forward. Um, the receiving neuron has receptor sites that are basically like little keyholes that are designed for a given neurotransmitter, right? <clears throat> you have these little neurotransmitters floating around. Picture like Harry Potter, the movie, the first movie where they got the keys flying around, right? Looks kind of like that in there. You got keys flying around and they're looking for keyholes. And when they slide in, it sends a signal to that neuron, which then can trigger additional buildup basically of energy, which then causes that neuron to fire into the next one. Remember, we have billions of neurons and trillions of connections between these, these neurons. Okay. So our synapses, we've literally got trillions of synapses going on within the brain. And, and the nervous system in our body. Uh, uh, 
So yeah, and that's essentially what's gonna be happening. As they fill in the gap, some of them are gonna actually cause it to basically like back off, it reduces the energy. Some of them cause an increase in energy, which will then increase the likelihood of that neuron firing off, okay. Um, any excess neurotransmitters, so if your body produces a bunch and there's 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 not enough keyholes for it, um, they'll, there's a thing called reuptake where basically the, the, the sending neuron will reabsorb most of those, uh, those, those uh, neurotransmitters back into themselves to be used again later. Okay. Those that don't get reused or reabsorbed um, might just float off and then kind of just gets absorbed by the body in general, uh, trans you know, transferred into other kinds of uh, proteins and things like that to be used in other places. Um, or in some cases just kind of disappears essentially. I mean, our body just absorbs it. Um, this is actually going to be how some medications also work. So some are going to increase the amount of neurotransmitters and, med and drugs and things like that also. The, the amount of neurotransmitters. Um, some are going to open up additional keyholes. Okay. Um, some are going to imitate the neurotransmitters and some are going to block the keyholes. So like so in some cases, depression and things might be caused by too many of certain neurotransmitters. Um, in order to deal with that, they might either block the keyholes, or it also can potentially block the reuptake. So your body is still producing the same amount, but it's not reabsorbing it as easily. And so therefore, it the, the keys basically remain floating in there for longer, which increases the chances of them finding a keyhole. Okay. Um, that's going to be some of the different some of the different factors there of how drugs and things can affect us in that. Slide nine, the nervous system. So that's the brain, specifically the individual cells, right? The individual neurons. Um, you can find an image similar to this one uh, on page 45. Actually, it's the exact same image, okay. Um, but the nervous system, part one. So the nervous system is electrochemical communication network consisting of all nerve cells of the peripheral and central nervous system. The nervous system as a whole is the brain and everything else in your body that basically is connected to it, okay. The communication network takes information from the wor uh, world and the body's tissues, so touch, um, sight, taste, uh, smell, hearing, all of these things are going to be connected to this nervous system, right? And then it brings it to the brain, where the brain then interprets the information coming into it and produces your experience. We're going to look at that more in depth when we look at the senses, but um, that's essentially going to be the, the core of it, right? Your body is constantly sending information to the brain via the nervous system, and then your brain is constantly sending information back to the body via the nervous system. Um, so it takes information from the body and the world tissues, makes decisions from that information, right? You have a baseball flying toward your head. Uh, your brain is able to, you're, you see it coming, hopefully, right? And it interprets it as there is something coming to your head and then it makes you react. You catch it. You move out of the way. You just sit there and stare and let it smack you in the face. Okay. Uh, but it makes decisions given the stimulus coming in through the neurons. It sends back information and orders the body's, t uh, orders to the body's tissues. So if you see the ball coming, like, here it comes, you dodge. That's because your brain has taken in information from your eyes, interpreted it, said an object is coming toward my head, better move, send signals out to the body, the body goes move, and you move out of the way. Okay. All right. Slide 10. The nervous system part two, three neuron types, sensory neurons. Um, sensory neurons carry incoming information from the body's tissues and sensory receptors to the brain and spinal cord, right? You touch something with your hands, there's a signal that goes from the tips of your fingers up through your arm into your spinal cord, and your spinal cord then sends it to the brain to be interpreted as what it is that you're feeling. Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it smooth? Is it rough? All those kinds of things. Okay. Small, big, all that. Um, eyes are doing the same thing. Ears are doing the same thing. Your taste buds, all that stuff is going to be combined to do those, those what they do. They're sending information. Okay. That's the sensory neurons. Motor neurons or, or uh, efferent neurons also carry ongoing information from the brain and spinal cord to the muscles and glands. Your brain interprets the information coming in through the sensory neurons and it sends out a signal through the motor neurons on what it wants your body to do. Um, and so that's going to be, you know, like if I want to move my hand up or, you know, whatever. Uh, if, I, if, if I get startled, it sends a signal to the adrenal glands to, to kick out some adrenaline. We're going to look at those in, in a minute or in, you know, the next one. Anyway, we're gonna look at them in a little bit. Um, and and it that affects your bodies in a different way, okay. We're actually gonna look at that in just a few minutes here. But 
Okay, and then uh, interneurons. Interneurons are the neurons within the brain and spinal cord. These are going to be the, the intercommunication, right? They communicate internally and process information between the sensory inputs and the motor outputs. Information comes in, the brain is dealing with that information coming in. That's the interneuron that's going to be doing that thinking. Okay, when you are thinking about something, it's the interneurons at work. When you take action, given what you're thinking, your body moves and things like that, um, that's the motor neurons. So sensory neurons, info coming in, interneurons, it's in, in between, intermediate, it's right there in the center, looking at it. Motor neurons, it's coming out and you're moving, moving like a motor. Okay. So be, 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 or take a look at those, get them to the point where you can comfortably identify them and, and communicate the three different, uh, the types of there that they are. Okay, nervous system part three, slide 11, peripheral nervous system. Um, so sensory and motor neurons that connect the central nervous system to the rest of the body. Again, when you see CNS anywhere in psychology, that's the central nervous system generally, okay. Um, the somatic system enables voluntary skeletal muscle control. You can find an image of this on page 46 if you're wanting to use the book instead. Um, an autonomic or ANS system controls glands and internal organs. Okay, <clears throat> so the somatic system, the, uh, are, is, it, the somatic system essentially is going to be all of your, your movements, right? It, it's what allows you to, to, to shift things around. Autonomic happens somewhat automatically, okay? You don't have to think about it. But it's going to be how your body it essentially kicks your body into gear, okay? Um, so the sympathetic nervous system uh, arouses and expends energy. So there's going to be basically within the autonomic nervous system, you're going to have two competing states. Sympathetic ramps your body up, gets it ready for action. Parasympathetic slows it down. Okay. Conserves energy as it calms, maintains homeostasis. Our body generally wants to be in the parasympathetic state. But if you experience stress of any kind, it is an increase in the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, and that's going to be basically the key. Stress could be literally anything, right? Um, it, it, it just depends on how we interpret a given event in our life. So it could be, you know, unfortunate news. It could be something startles you. It could be, uh, you know, you're, you're, you turn on your car. There's actually, when you turn on your car, there is a slight increase in your sympathetic nervous system's aroused state. You are in a state of stress while you are driving. Um, but basically, going to be the two of these. When you when you experience stress at an extreme level, we, it seems like in psychology you always use this same example. But at an extreme level, it'd be like a bear charging out of the brush at you, right? Um, you know, or or maybe I don't know, a chainsaw killer, whatever you want to do. Something really scary comes out at you, and you're not expecting it, right? Your sibling jumps out of the closet at you, and you weren't expecting them to be there, or your spouse in some cases, or your children, whatever. Something happens, and you weren't expecting it, and it's extremely startling. Your sympathetic nervous system basically throws the switches, which increases, uh, your eyes are gonna dilate, take in as much light as possible, okay? Um, your heart is going to accelerate, it's gonna pump, pumping harder. Uh, your stomach, you're gonna, you're probably gonna, if, if you're really scared, you might vomit, okay? Um, but it's gonna inhibit digestion. Your body basically doesn't wanna waste energy. You, you only have so much blood and so much energy to use. It doesn't wanna waste energy on digestion uh, if you are potentially going to be having to run for your life and or fight for your life, right? A bear is coming at you or something. Um, so yeah, inhibits digestion, including the stomach and the, and the pancreas in this case. Um, the liver is going to stimulate glucose. Uh, basically, it's going to start producing more sugar for you to have quick energy in your system. Um, adrenal glands <clears throat> are triggered, which uh, stimulates secretion of epinephrine and neuroepinephrine. Uh, these are going to be the things that where you get like the adrenaline rush, okay? It gives you that boost, right? It makes you feel like, wow, I can do anything. <clears throat> uh, relaxes your bladder, which is why you might wet your pants if you get really scared. And it can stimulate ejaculation in males. <clears throat> so, real quick, this is, and the, 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 the sympathetic nervous system essentially is a roused state. An aroused state <clears throat> can be caused by a lot of different things. It can be anything from being scared to being excited, um, which is why you're, physiologically, 
a bear charging out of the woods at you and seeing your crush coming down the hall toward you are going to have the same effect. Okay. Your, your, your body is going to enter into a more aroused state, ready for action. And it's your interpretation of that that gives you the different emotions. We're going to look at that when we look at emotions later on in the semester, but uh, a different module. But just be aware. So there's a aroused state. <clears throat> the parasympathetic is going to be calming us. Our body wants to stay calm. Okay. In this case, the, the, the pupils are, will contract. They don't need to bring as much light as normal or as, as you were when you're in like an intense state. Heartbeat slows down to its normal state. For a resting person, that's really going to be around 70-ish, give or take, uh, heartbeats per minute. Unless you're an athlete, then it might be lower. Or if you're really out of shape, it might be higher. But generally, for most people, 70, 75, give or take. Um, your digestion kicks back in. You're able to, you're able to actually feel like eating something again. Um, gallbladder kicks in, <clears throat> starts producing more stuff to help you with, with, with digesting your foods. Um, so when you have your gallbladder still, uh, your bladder contracts and is able to hold itself again. And blood flow is allowed back to the sex organs, which will, uh, reduce the chances of ejaculation. Um, and that's going to be basically the, the, the state, at least within the male. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's going to be the two states that your, 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 your automatic, autonomic, okay, which is automatic, autonomic nervous system does. All this happens where you don't have to think about it, right? There's no conscious thought. You're not like, I'm scared. I should get myself, you know, aroused so that I can take action. If you had to do that, we'd be dead, right? It just happens. Um, and, and, and then the reason why it can take a while to kind of calm back down is because when you have that, that like let's say somebody jumps out of the closet at you and you're like, bah! okay, um, that bah! moment, you, your body has just released a bunch of hormones into the system, which take a lot more time to get out of your system. So your, you might be like, you might experience the shakes or something after that because of all of the uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine and the other adrenal glands uh, hormones are now in your system. Fine motor skills go down the dumps. Gross motor skills become very strong. So a big motion, easy to do. Small motion, like picking up, you know, a pin or something. You're like, ah, I got this. Uh, not as easy. Okay. Writing your name right after you've been scared, you're going to be all like jittery and everything. If, you, if you've ever been in like a, a class, um, going in there, you know, like they're like, like giving a speech and like, oh dear, you know, that's, that's what you're going to be dealing with basically. Okay. I just realized I forgot to give all my, my. Random facts. I want to go ahead and give some. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's uh, pause this just for a second. Back. Here we go. So our first random fact, <clears throat> 2009, Stephen Hawking held a party for time travelers but didn't publicize it until after, so only time travelers would know about it. Unfortunately, no one else showed up other than Stephen Hawking. So whether that proves anything or not, who knows? But yeah, Stephen Hawking, 2009, gave a party for time travelers. No one showed up. Bummer. Um, I'll, give, I'll give a few more here just real quick. Okay. Um, boop, boop, boop. Slide 12. The nervous system. You know, oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. Might be a weird little like me staring at you for a second. The nervous system, part four. Uh, the central nervous system, or CNS, the brain is going to be the main part of this, right? The neural networks, neuron work uh, group clusters, okay? Again, I talked about like the brain is just, when you're born, you just have all of this like blah, like a, like a big bramble bush, and then it prunes itself, it, it thins itself out. Um, <clears throat> the, the neuron work group clusters are basically going to be where, where certain parts of the brain, just like people typically do, um, parts of the brain that need to communicate more often are going to move closer together. So you go back 150 years ago with people, okay? If I wanted to send a message from New York to somebody in California, I would the fastest I could maybe do maybe is like the the Pony Express if they were around, um, and they could get my letter there within like a couple weeks, okay? It's gonna be hard to do business if it's gonna take like a couple weeks for me to get a letter there, and then a couple weeks for them to get a letter back to me. That's like a month down the road, right? And I'm like, I, hopefully nothing happened since then, um, and that's assuming the letter made it anyway. Um, on the other hand, if we both lived in New York city and you're just like down the road from me and I'm like, I got to get a message to you. I could literally walk out and send you a message. The closer you are in proximity, the easier it is to communicate. The brain does the same thing. 
parts of the brain that work together are going to, to cluster closer and closer together. Um, with, in fact, the, the two sides of the brain, left side and right side, uh, you're going to have a, a, a very large number of, of communication and, and neurons centered at the center of the brain where the two sides of the brain can communicate more easily. So the brain itself. And then the spinal cord. Two-way system of ascending and descending neural fibers. Okay. Um, which is essentially going to be that. It's going to be like the main hub, right? It's, it's the main... Uh, it's where all the information coming in from the rest of the body goes to and then goes up to the brain. Reflexes are going to be something that the spinal cord does on its own. So reflex, if you've ever tapped your knee and your foot does a little thing with that, you have to think about it. Um, when, you, when you touch someone's hand, they're going to want to automatically grab. You rub the bottom of the foot, the toes curl, things like that. Um, those are going to be reflexes. They happen without you intending to do this. Okay. Uh, if you touch something hot and you jerk back from it, okay, uh, generally that's going to be a reflex. What a reflex does essentially, so like I say, touch something hot or somebody pricks you with a needle, it the signal is sent from the finger, in this case, if I'm touching something hot, to the spinal cord. The spinal cord reads it as damage. Okay, there's a lot of signals coming in from that finger because it's getting damaged. And it sends a reaction back before it's in, as it's sending the message on to the brain. This is why a reflex can occur, and generally will occur, if it is a reflex, before the brain has time to process it. You'll be pulling back before your brain says, oh, you're being hurt. You should do something about this. Okay. Um, and then it sends a signal basically saying, oh, you've been damaged, you know, like take care of it kind of thing. But the, the, you're already reacting. You're already having a reflex away from it before the brain has a chance to actually do that. Okay. Um, so you can find information on that in our book on page 48 toward the end of the module. Random fact. Here we go. Random fact number two. There's no period in Dr. Pepper. So the DR, there's no dot after the DR. It looked like dye pepper in the old logo's font. And so because of that, they just took the they took the, the dot out afterwards. So we're gonna keep it doctor. So there you go. Random fact. Um, okay. Slide 13. There's an image here that you can also find on page 48. Uh, the endocrine system. So the endocrine system is gonna be the the uh, the, the hormonal system basically. It's a slow chemical communication system set of glands that secretes hormones into the bloodstream, which then affect the body's tissues. Okay, so some terms to learn are going to be uh, hormones, which is a chemical messenger that are manufactured by the endocrine glands, and they travel through the bloodstream and affect other tissues, right? Um, so, for example, the adrenal glands, when they release their hormones, you know, all of that aroused state, most of those are going to be coming from those adrenal glands. There are other glands that are also going to be connected to that, but that's, they're going to be, that's their main thing. Okay. Um, the adrenal glands, uh, which pr produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, and, and, uh, th these are going to be those, those arousing, uh, things that are connected to stress. Okay. So just be aware of that. And then the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is the endocrine system's most influential gland. This is like the master gland. Um, under the influence of the hypoth hypothalamus, part of the brain, which we're going to learn more about, um, the pituitary regulates growth and controls other endocrine glands. So basically, it's going to be like the, the, the hypothalamus will send signals to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland will send hormone signals that then go through the body really quickly, um, which then basically cause the other glands to then fire off their hormones, whatever they happen to be. Okay, um, so like your thyroid, um, the thyroid gland, the parathyroids, uh, adrenal glands, pancreas, testes, ovaries for so testes for men, ovaries for women. All of these things are going to be um, causing different hormones to be produced for different occasions and different situations. Okay, um, just kind of be aware of those. Now remember, these are slower too. So the, the, the brain, basically, if it's using nervous system, they, they can happen very quickly, and they can be turned off very quickly, okay? Someone jumps out at you, you're like, ah, and your brain's like, wait, no, that's just your sibling, and you're, oh, okay. But your adrenal glands have been already engaged, and it can take, like, all of a sudden you're a little jittery for, like, the next 15, 30 minutes, right, afterwards. Um, you stand up to give, a, to give a public speech, and you're like, okay, and then you, you're like, I'm done, and then you're like, oh, you know, calm down. 
but you're still all shaky for the next 30 minutes. That is because of um, the hormones are still in your system and it takes a while for them to dissipate. It's also to some extent why if you drink too much caffeine, you might be all jittery. Um, caffeine basically will, will, will trigger the adrenal glands. It, it makes you think that you're in a, a state of arousal or it needs to be in a state of arousal, which will then kick in more epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, which then makes you seem all stressed out and jittery. Okay. Next random fact, random fact number three. Um, they have discovered sharks living in an active underwater volcano, but no one can investigate due to the heat and acidity of the water causing immediate burns to anybody who goes to look at them. Don't know how they do it. They're just there. Weird stuff. Scientists find all kinds of weird things in the ocean. Okay. Um, next slide, slide 14. And so this feedback system reveals the intimate connection of the nervous and endocrine systems, uh, brain, pituitary, which, so the brain affects the pituitary gland, the pituitary gland affects other glands, other glands produce the hormones, the hormones affect the body and the brain, and it basically causes the cycle to happen. The nervous system directs endocrine secretions, which they then affect the nervous system. Um, so again, the brain is like, we need this, it sends a signal, the hormones are released, then that, that affects how the brain and everything is working. Um, conducting and coordinating this whole electrochemical system is the flexible brain, the amazing human brain. And with that, I'm gonna give you the last little piece of random information. So Swedish meatballs originated from a recipe King Charles XII brought back from Turkey in the early 1800s. Weird. Why did they call them tur Turkish meatballs? I have no idea. But yeah, Swedish meatballs were actually originally a Turkish recipe. So that's that. So that is a, a, the module three in a nutshell. Hopefully that helps make sense. Um, make sure you read through the, the chapter, take the quiz on these random facts that I've just given you. Um, and we'll go from there. So in the, in the next module, we'll be looking at the uh, tools of discovery, the older portions of the brain um, and the limbic system, basically kind of the, the more core aspects of the brain uh, that are we have more in common with most other things that have brains. So. Um, till then, have a great one. I hope everything goes well for you. Good luck with the quizzes, and I will talk to you in the next one. Have a great day.